The Sugar Hill Gang. There's much that's already publicly known about the Sugar Hill Gang, so I won't waste time discussing those things. Instead, I'll discuss the things that aren't so known about Sugar Hill. This story is one that's special and is close to me because as a nine-year-old kid in Virginia, rap music changed my life, and the Sugar Hill Gang was that vehicle that brought rap to me. Like many other kids outside of the tri-state area, I did not have the luxury of hearing tapes from the T Connection, the Ecstasy Garage, the Disco Fever, and other places where rap was performed live. I feel that I'm in a fortunate and unbiased position as I have really good friendships and relationships with most of the Bronx pioneers of hip hop. But at the same time, once again, the Sugar Hill Gang was that vehicle that brought the music to me. At the same time, I've been fortunate enough to have relationships and friendships with many of the executives and musicians from Sugar Hill Records and many of the label mates of the Sugar Hill Gang. I believe that these relationships and the resulting conversations give me a very unbiased point of view with which to look at the history, the music, and the entire story. I can simultaneously relate to and understand the disdain that many of the Bronx pioneers have toward the Sugar Hill Gang. And as well, I can understand the Sugar Hill Gang in their position, and as Master G so eloquently said to me, being in the right place at the right time with the right shit. So here we go. One of the biggest falsehoods about the Sugar Hill Gang is that they were a put together group who had no history rapping before they met Sylvia Robinson of Sugar Hill Records. Now this does hold true for Big Bang Hank, rest in peace, who was a bouncer at a club in the Bronx called Sparkle, and he also was the manager for the Cold Crush Brothers. Many of the pioneering Bronx MCs knew Hank and Hank knew them, but he had no history as an MC. But Wonder Mike and Master G were MCs in Sound on Sound and Phase 2 respectively. In fact, if you listen close enough to the lyrics of Rapper's Delight, Master G mentions Phase 2 several times in his rhymes, and Wonder Mike also mentions Sound on Sound. Master G tells me that those are the only two crews in the T-Neck, Hackensack, Inglewood, New Jersey area doing hip-hop. G says that before the Sugar Hill Gang was formed, he didn't know Wonder Mike, but he knew of him. In fact, he said that his group Phase 2 was inspired by Sound on Sound. He said that Phase 2 would put two home stereo systems together when they gave parties. Sound on Sound was an organized crew of 10 or 15 MCs with real equipment, turntables, and mixers. Master G says that even before rap was on record, one of his favorite records to spin and rap to simultaneously was Dance to the Drummer's Beat by Herman Kelly and Life. Both G and Mike said that they had heard stories of DJ Hollywood at the Apollo and Flash and the Furious Five in the Bronx, and that tapes from those groups like the Cold Crush Brothers and the Furious Five had reached New Jersey before rap records were made. Wonder Mike said that he was inspired to be an MC by his cousin who was in Sound on Sound as a DJ who brought tapes to him of New York groups. Mike says that all the groups on the tapes sounded alike, so he had a job moving furniture at the time, and while he was working, he would make up his own rhymes to himself. In addition to phrases like, yes, yes, y'all, to the beat, you don't stop, and segues like that, was a hip hop, hip it to the hippity type thing that he did on intro Rapper's Delight but most rappers didn't extend it out as long as he did. So that became his signature, that intro that you heard for Rapper's Delight. It's so infamous now. He said he had also heard other MCs previously say the bang bang boogie type rhymes, but that the B letter was so percussive that he added the baby bubble to the boogity beat and things of that nature to give it more punch. Now, Wonder Mike says he started rhyming in May of 1979, which is about three or four months before Rapper's Delight dropped. He says that he knows that's a problem for a lot of MCs, but he can't help where he was born and when he was born and being in the right place at the right time. By now, everyone's heard some variation of the story of how the Sugar Hill Gang got discovered. Big Bang Hank in the pizza parlor, Sylvia Robinson walking in, Master G walking by, Wonder Mike happening to be in the same area at the same time. As with everything, there are some elements of truth to those variations of the story, but there are some things that are not widely known. For instance, Sylvia Robinson's niece, Deborah, threw a party for Sylvia at Harlem World. Handling turntable duties and holding down the mic device at the same time was Lovebug Starsky that night. 
That was the first time that Sylvia was introduced to hip hop. She inquired to her niece Deborah what this thing was that everybody was doing. So the first person that was considered to be a rapper on the newly formed Sugar Hill Records, coming out of her all platinum, turbo, and Stang record labels was Lovebug Starsky. In fact, Master G tells me that Lovebug Starsky actually had recorded music that was gonna be released on Sugar Hill, but it never was. He never signed. In fact, the backing musical track that ended up being Freedom, the debut by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, was first given to Lovebug Starsky, and he recorded something to that beat. But again, it's unreleased. Master G confirmed that he's actually seen and heard Love Buzz Starsky record at the Sugar Hill Studios. Wonder Mike tells me that there's a cat named Casper in Sound on Sound who was originally supposed to be a rapper for Sylvia before she met Hank, Master G, or Wonder Mike. But Casper's father was an executive at Atlantic Records and he told Casper not to sign the contract. It was Wonder Mike's DJ, Ron the Mad Mixer, who suggested using Good Times by Sheik for the backing track for Rapper's Delight. In fact, the instrumental had already been cut before Wonder Mike, Master G, and Big Bang Hank were even part of the picture, and Casper was gonna rap over it. Additionally, Sylvia Robinson had already heard a tape of Sound on Sound with Wonder Mike on it, and she passed on him. Wonder Mike, at the time, suffered from asthma, and he said on the tape he gave a very poor performance. In fact, he was mad at his DJ for letting Sylvia hear it. He said he was losing his breath and his voice wasn't right. So all of these things transpired before Sylvia Robinson even walked into Krispy Crust Pizza and saw Big Bang Hank playing a tape and rapping along to it. So from what I can ascertain from hearing the story of Bobby Robinson, no relation to Sylvia Robinson, in Harlem, and Sylvia Robinson in Jersey, both of these ex doo-wop and R&B executives were surrounded by hip hop. Everywhere they went, they had children that were into it and it was everywhere that they went. So it was inevitable at some point that somebody would have the business savvy to say, okay, this can work on a record. But back to the story. Sylvia Robinson did eventually walk into Krispy Crust Pizza, see Big Bank Hank playing a tape, and inquire about it and invite him to an audition. But plans had already been in place that did not come to fruition. So Hank, who had not gotten Kaz's rhyme book yet, most likely just said whatever rhymes were hot at the time. Master G did happen to be walking by, and as he said again, with the right shit at the right time, and he auditioned, that much is true. And later that night, Wonder Mike did find out that they were auditioning at Sylvia Robinson's house, and he joined, and he ended up auditioning also. But he barely made it. Sylvia had already decided that she wanted to go with Master G and Big Bang Hank, and Wonder Mike hadn't spoken up yet. But he finally spoke up and explained to her that she had heard a previous recording of him that wasn't a good recording, but he wanted to re-audition. She said no at first, she was about to go to bed, she was tired. In fact, Master G said she had put her slippers on and was headed to bed, but she turned around and listened to Wonder Mike spit his rhyme. And the rest is history. Now, Sylvia was very much into numerology, and she said that three was a magic number. She already had a very successful group called The Moments, who would later on be called Ray Goodman and Brown. That was a three-man group that had brought much success for her, and she really believed that these three would do something big, and history shows that they did. Now we could talk all day about Rapper's Delight, but I'd rather talk about the things that really haven't been discussed much about the record. Now by the time the song was recorded, Hank had gone to Kaz and gotten his notebook, borrowed some rhymes. Master G and Wonder Mike already had rhymes from their Sound on Sound and Phase 2 days. The only thing that was added were the pass-offs. Like next on the mic is my man Hank, come on Hank sing that song. That was added. And the intro was added because Wonder Mike said that the fact that he was the first MC on the record and really the first MC that the world would hear outside of the tri-state area, he wanted to do a special intro because he felt like the record would be big probably in the tri-state area and, and, and no bigger than that. So he wanted to do a special intro. 
So he took the old saying from a TV show, this is not a test, and he flipped it to the what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. Everything else in the song were rhymes that Wonder Mike and Master G already were doing with their groups in Jersey. Now everybody knows that Sheik's Good Times is the backing track for Rapper's Delight. It was performed by Positive Force from Philadelphia, who also had a hit on Sugar Hill Records, We Got the Funk. Many people thought that the band that would later become the Sugar Hill Band, and that used to be called Wood, Brass, and Steel, was the group that was playing on Rapper's Delight. But that group consisting of Doug Wimbish, Skip Alexander, and others, had already left Sylvia. The bass player, Doug Wimbish, said that the first time he heard Rapper's Delight, he was at Leo's Welfare Disco, <laughs> which was next door to a welfare office in Connecticut. Because Doug Wimbish had a trained ear and he's a musician, he knew immediately that that record, Rapper's Delight, was recorded at All Platinum Studios. He said it was something about the sound. You knew if a record was recorded at Philadelphia International or Motown just from the sound of the record, and he knew that that was an All Platinum production. Well, he put two and two together because Sylvia Robinson had been calling his mother's house for weeks trying to reach him, and he wasn't answering the calls or returning the calls. So he found out later that that was what the calls were for. She was trying to get the band back together because she was starting this new rap thing and this new label called Sugar Hill Records. The intro to the song is by a group called Love Deluxe. It's a disco song called Here Comes That Sound Again. The bass line for Rapper's Delight, which of course originally was Bernard Edwards of Chic, rest in peace, great bass line, was replayed by Chip Sharon. Chip Sharon played that bass line for 15 minutes straight, no punch-ins, no mistakes. And as far as the vocals, there were a few punch-ins on Rapper's Delight. And if you listen closely and you have a trained ear, you can actually hear a few of them. But once again, we could talk about Rapper's Delight all day. Some of the standout things are that Wonder Mike said the story he told about the chicken tasting like wood and going to a friend's house to eat was actually based on a true story. He said it was one of his female friends. He went to dinner and the dinner just wasn't good. The chicken was underdone when he bit into it, blood came out of it, and all he could eat was the macaroni and cheese and whatever the sides were. So that was a true story, a classic rhyme based on a true story. 98 or 99% of Hank rhymes were from Kaz's notebook. And he added some hotel, motel, which are things that Hollywood and other MCs used to say. So, so we know the story on Hank. And interestingly, Master G said a rhyme in Rapper's Delight. It went, it was 12 o'clock one Friday night. I was rapping to the beat, feeling all right. This girl came into the room. All the fellas checked out her white sassoons. That was a true story. And the object of his affections in that rhyme and those white sassoons would eventually one day be the mother of his son. And those are just a few interesting points about Rapper's Delight. I mean, we all know the 15-minute rap record that set it off and actually exposed rap to the world at large. The planets definitely lined up with that one, and perhaps there was something to Sylvia's numerology and her three being the magic number and knowing that that thing was going to work because it worked, and history shows us that it worked very well. Now, with the whirlwind success of Rapper's Delight, and the radio actually doing an unprecedented thing by playing a 15 minute song several times a day because the request lines were just over flooded with requests for it. This gave the Robinsons an indication that they had a huge hit on their hands and they needed to follow up. So Rapper's Delight was released about three or four months before 1980 hit. Well, by 1980, they had recorded enough music for an entire album. The Sugar Hill Gang's debut album, which was released in 1980, contained a mixture of R&B songs and a few rap songs. By this time, the label had signed their first female rap group, The Sequence, consisting of Blondie, Angie B, and Cheryl the Pearl. Sylvia paired them up for Rapper's Reprise. Better 
know as the ladies told us the things I do you know off the most it's a part of your love and I am your host. now this was a song that I loved as a 10 year old in 1980 but rap was so new and I loved it so much that I would have liked anything that somebody was rapping over most likely but the group absolutely hated it they used to perform it in their live show but Big Bank Hank especially hated the song he hated it so much that one night he just refused to come out on stage to perform it and soon after the group just stopped performing the song another interesting point about Big Bank Hank is that after Rapper's Delight he didn't write any rhymes well he didn't write his rhymes for Rapper's Delight we know that but after that he didn't write anything so he wasn't entitled to any mechanical royalties at all any writer's royalties because he never wrote anything it was Master G and Wonder Mike who wrote his rhymes and also Cheryl the Pearl who was a collaborating writer with the Sugar Hill Gang on many of their hits but back to the Sugar Hill Gang debut album there were a few good ballads on the album that of course weren't sung by the Sugar Hill Gang, just members of the Sugar Hill House Band and Craig Derry and other writers that were around the label from back in the days contribute some R&B songs to the album. This was Sylvia's suggestion because she felt like rap was a youth driven music, but she wanted to expand it and get the older people involved as well. And it probably worked. When I think back of looking through crates of records of, of older folks back in the days, a lot of them had that album and I think uh, some of the appeal of course was Rapper's Delight was just universally uh, a great record at the time but also uh, some of the appeal might have been some of the R&B stuff on there as well but one of the best songs on the album and one of the most underrated and best songs by the Sugar Hill Gang in my opinion is the Sugar Hill Groove musically it was a combination of Catch a Groove by Juice and Glide by Pleasure Wonder Mike said that that's one of his favorite songs by the group, but he hated the sound quality. He said it sounded like the mics were too far away, and I agree, but it was still a great record. He said that in the studio was a kind of a crude setup. He said it was just three microphones, no walls, and nothing to separate the MCs from each other. He said it was just him on the left, Hank in the middle, and Master G on the right. Keith LeBlanc, the house drummer, also had some complaints about the studio setup, or at least the quality of the sound. He said that no matter what you recorded there, everything just sounded like mid-range. No lows, no highs, just mid-range, no matter what you recorded. But one of the incredible things about the Sugar Hill Groove came at the end of the record. Sylvia Robinson, because she was an R&B megastar in her day, still had quite a bit of contacts. And one of her contacts was Tito Puente, the legendary percussionist. She invited him to play at the end of the Sugar Hill Groove, and it's one of the best parts of the record. Interestingly also, Keith LeBlanc told me that Dizzy Gillespie played on the song, but they couldn't get his part to match the actual mood of the song and it just didn't sound right, so they never used it. So that Sugar Hill Gang LP was a nice follow-up to the incredible debut, Rapper's Delight. 1980 also brought Hot Summer Day, which was basically one of Master G's ideas. He was in his apartment doing a hot Jersey summer day and he had AC, but it wasn't central air conditioning. So it was hot in his apartment. And that was the motivation for him to write hot summer day. He started thinking about all the fun things about summer and he just wanted to write a summer anthem. I like hot summer day, but I also have to admit that after Rapper's Delight, we got the funk by Positive Force and Funk You Up by Sequence. We were buying anything that had that blue Candy Stripe logo. These records weren't heavily promoted. Sylvia and Joe Robinson's operation was certainly an independent operation. And Joe Robinson would get on the phone with his radio people 
which included Butterball in Philly, Frankie Crocker in New York, and other connections that they had. So we bought a lot of these records just off of going into the record store, seeing it, oh, Sugar Hill Gang, Sugar Hill Records, it's probably good, 50-50 chance, and we bought it. But one of the standout things about Hot Summer Day, as far as hip hop and pop culture, will be the freak the funk part that was one of Master G's signature phrases. And it's been sampled a few times by other hip hoppers. But the second big single by the Sugar Hill Gang also came out in 1980, which is a busy year for the group, obviously. Based on Seventh Wonder's Daisy Lady, the Sugar Hill Gang dropped Eighth Wonder, one of the ultimate party records of the early 80s. With typical 80s fun rhymes written by Wonder Mike and Cheryl the Pearl from Sequence, combined with the Furious Five in the background doing ad libs and party tracks, Eighth Wonder was a sure shot and a party starter. And a few vocal pieces from Eighth Wonder would also be used by other rappers in the future. In 1981, Maurice Starr and Michael Johnson, who operated their own label, Boston International Records, would approach Sylvia Robinson about doing some production work for the label. They had already cut a song called Rapper's Showdown in their home studio, and Sylvia used them for a few more recordings on the Sugar Hill label. She was impressed with the fact that between the two of them, they were able to play multiple instruments. Maurice Starr, of course, would have his own successful solo recording career and go on to discover the new kids on the block in New Edition. His brother Michael Johnson, of course, would front the Johnson crew who recorded for Tommy Boy Records. But the two brothers were actually rapping on the rapper's showdown track. Sylvia liked the track and she was going to give it to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Then as she listened to it, she thought it would be better for the Sugar Hill Gang and she went back and forth between the two groups to see which one would get the track. Finally, she got the idea to make it a collaboration, somewhat like Sugar Hill Gang had done earlier with the sequence and Rapper's Reprise, or like what Spoonie G had done with the sequence on Monster Jam. So this Rapper's Showdown track, produced by Maury star Michael Johnson, ended up being Showdown. The Sugar Hill Gang meets the Furious Five. Now Wonder Mike said that they were basically ambushed, they didn't know it was going to be a battle. They were all in the studio at the same time recording, but not in the booth at the same time. Mike says if you listen to their lyrics, they're just having a good time and laid back. They say things like, if forget about your problems, throw away your bills because you're being possessed by the sounds of Sugar Hill. But he said the energy that the Furious Five brought to it was like a battle. Mike says that they were saying things like, we can't lose and you know who's going to survive. So he said basically they kicked our ass on that record because we didn't know it was a battle. Mike said that he was also frustrated for the entire course that they were signed with Sugar Hill Records. He says there was an effort to give them this squeaky clean image and that really wasn't them. Now they weren't thugs or anything, he's talking strictly about their vocal delivery. He says that the cadence that he rapped in on a lot of those songs was not his original cadence from when he rapped with Sound on Sound but then Sylvia encouraged that cadence. In fact, he said when he listens to records like Showdown and Hot Hot Summer Day, he says it sounds like some Lawrence Welk shit. But Showdown was a huge hit. Both fans of the Furious Five and the Sugar Hill Gang was delighted to see them collaborate on a record, and it was a hot record in 1981. In 1981, the Sugar Hill Gang released the album titled Eighth Wonder. It was one of those recordings on the Sugar Hill label that was more of a compilation than a true album. Three or four of the songs had been previously released, but the surprises here were Funk Box and Gigolo. 
These songs were more funk than rap, but they were a very pleasant surprise in 1981. Nineteen eighty one was also the year that Wonder Mike says things started to go downhill for them. They released Apache. Apache is probably a bigger hit today than it was back then. It was made even more famous by its inclusion on the Fresh Prince of Bel Air show back in the nineties. It is also played at many sporting events, and it's just a huge part of the popular culture. The members of the group said that they liked some parts of the record, the parts that were based on the incredible bongo band beat. But the other arrangements they did not like, and the unga unga and things of that nature, they said it was too corny for them, and they felt like it was going to be the nail in their coffin. Even with those things being said, Apache is one of their big records, along with rappers delight and Nate Wonder. Perhaps what Mike said was true about that song being the nail in their coffin because they really didn't have any huge hits after that song. In all fairness, things were starting to change in rap as well. Profile Records had started releasing songs by the Disco Four, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and k Rob and Rom LZ. The Soul Sonic Force were making huge records, and some of the artists on Enjoy Records like the Fearless Four were still doing very big records. In 1982, the Sugar Hill Gang released The Lover In You. The Lover In You was essentially an early rap love song. It was slickly produced and the sound quality was a lot better than their previous songs. Wonder Mike attributes this to the fact that it was produced by Pete Wingfield from England, who also produced It's Good To Be The Queen by Sylvia which was her debut as a rapper. Even though The Lover and You may seem a bit sappy at times, rap songs hadn't really developed their hard edge yet. And musically, there was some really great synthesizer work on this song, and the vocals were very good. Nineteen eighty three brought the word is out. One of the things Wonder Mike says he remembers the most about that record is that it had a weird timing to it. He said the timing reminds him of like a jazz fusion record. By 1983, so many things were happening within rap that it was almost not fashionable to be listening to the Sugar Hill Gang at this time. Nineteen eighty three would also bring Kick It Live from nine to five. This one was so unmemorable that when I mentioned it to Wonder Mike, he said he forgot how it went. I had to actually rap the hook for him to remember it. And when I rapped the hook, he cut across me to call it a overproduced Sugar Hill musical accident. Now I didn't think it was that bad at the time, and I was happy that they were finally introducing scratching and some modern techniques to some of the Sugar Hill Records recording catalog. Let's make some noise. 
But again, things moved so fast in rap music, by this time it was over. Too much had happened. And if Run DMC had not dropped yet, they were just about to drop and the whole game was just about to change. The message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was one of the top grossing and highest selling records on the Sugar Hill label. Sylvia went to many of the artists on the label with that song and no one wanted to do it. It was just too depressing, too slow, too realistic, just totally against everything rap stood for at that time. It was still very much a party music. But the Sugar Hill Gang was offered the song. But Sylvia says that it's a good thing that the Furious Five ended up doing the record because their image fit the song perfectly. Well, in 1984, the Sugar Hill Gang would make their first attempt at socially conscious hip hop. Living in the fast lane was a redemption of sorts as far as their previous two or three singles. It wasn't nearly as ominous or dark as The Message, but it was a socially conscious song that warns of the trappings of a good life and fast money. Interesting side note about living in the fast lane. Master G says that Hank was the one who always had a lot of problems laying his lyrics. They always had to do a bunch of retakes for Hank. But the day they recorded living in the fast lane, for some reason Hank was just really hyped. And he came in the studio hype, and for the first time ever, he laid his vocals in one take. In fact, G says that he was so hyped that if you hear the beginning of his verse, he comes in and says, get hip, y'all, you know, with his heavy voice that he had. And that wasn't an intended part of the record. In 1984, the Sugar Hill Gang would also release an album titled Living in the Fast Lane. This album was one of the first times on the Sugar Hill label that a full-length LP was released that didn't have previously released songs. I think Kick It Live may have been the only previously released song on the album. But historically on the label, a full album would be more of just a greatest hits compilation. One of the singles on the album was called Girls. It was a remake of a song by the Whatnots, which was a group that was signed to one of Sylvia's previous labels. The group really hated the song, and they said it was a stretch to even record it because they were trying to actually remake a song that was a singing song into a rap song. One of the other standout songs on the album was a song called Troy. It was musically based on She's Looking Like a Hobo by Malcolm McLaren and the world's famous Supreme Team. This same musical track was also used by the West Street Mob for a song called Mosquito. One of the first about this song was it was the first time that Sylvia actually let the group produce a song. Are steaming, the air is cracked with the sound of screaming. Two gangs are out to even the score in the alley with the rats and burned out stores with bricks and chains and a taste for pain. Every man falls prey to the war in his vein, but the leader called Blade still standing tall. His shadow cast big on the bloody wall. His face is etched with the life he chose in the sweat. Also worth noting on the Living in the Fast Lane LP was a song called Space Race. Space Race was recorded around the same time that The Message was recorded. In fact, the music was going to originally be the music for The Message Part 2, Survival. But Ed Fletcher, a.k.a. Duke Booty, told me that the multi-instrumentalist Reggie Griffin had joined the label and brought with him his own music for The Message 2, Survival, which was also the music for Scorpio. But if one just listens to the music from Space Race, it does sound strikingly similar to The Message. Guess before breakfast, gotta pack a bag. Shuttle's fast if you like to get around. My mind's on the move, my behind's on the ground. Come on. So you wanna be an astronaut? Can we clear for liftoff? The Living in the Fast Lane LP would be the last time that Master G recorded with the Sugar Hill Gang. He left the group over frustrations from the financial situation at Sugar Hill Records. He went and started his own magazine business and was successful in that and also recorded a song called Do It on Atlantic Records.
Meanwhile, the Sugar Hill Gang replaced Master G with Corey O, and they released two songs with that lineup. One was called Work the Body, and the other was called The Downbeat. The year was 1989. The Sugar Hill label had been shut down for four or five years, and no one had heard from the Sugar Hill Gang. But Ben Lieberin remixed Rapper's Delight in a club style, which was the popular music for that time, and it breathed new life into the song that was already 10 years old. Even though Sugar Hill Records was officially shut down, they would release a greatest hits compilation here and there, and in 89, they oddly packaged the remix along with a bunch of older Sugar Hill songs and a record cover that didn't reflect the times at all. These were promotional shots probably from the early 80s. But the song did do very well. It hit really hard in the clubs and the Sugar Hill Gang got a chance to perform it on Van Silk's Rap Mania. Over the years, there's been a lot of drama. Court proceedings, lawsuits, identity theft, and even death. But Master G and Wonder Mike are recording currently as the Sugar Hill Gang, which is very good news. The Sugar Hill Gang is the group that kicked in the doors for everyone else to come in and eat afterwards. We could easily say if they didn't come along, somebody else would have done it, but we really don't know that. They came in with the perfect song at the perfect time, and they paid the dues that those after them would not have to pay. I remember Ed Fletcher, a.k.a. Duke Booty, telling me that when they toured with certain groups, groups like the Barcades would cut off the lights in the middle of the Sugar Hill Gang set because those R&B groups of the day didn't understand rap and they didn't respect it. They would put tape on the soundboard so the sound wouldn't go above four. But when their groups came out, they would have the sound on seven or eight. That way the rappers automatically sounded very low in comparison to the R&B groups that came out. And there's dozens of other examples of disrespect that these guys received at the hands of people that didn't understand or respect this new form of music that was brought forth by the Sugar Hill Gang. The gang does not claim to be the originators of the music, but they are the ones who brought it to the world. They're constantly put down and called a put-together group, but they were rhyming before they met Sylvia Robinson. And many pioneering MCs who get respect were put together also. In fact, most groups were put together. They auditioned for somebody, or somebody told somebody about this one and said, hey, you should get with that one. So the group does get a bad rap. But their successes, as well as their failures, would serve as the blueprints and templates that we all would benefit from. And this is Jay Kwan, MC, DJ, producer, hip hop historian. You can check out more information on Foundation Era groups at my website, thefoundation.com. That's T H A, thefoundation.com. Hit me up on social media at Jaquan VA and hit me directly on email at jquan.org. I'm a type of person that never like to copy things that are out there. I always like to come with something new, something different. And I felt as though if I came with a concept like this, either it was gonna hit or it was gonna miss. And I really felt strong about it, that it was gonna be a hit. I made the music, he said, hip. Huh? The hip, the hip to the hip, hip hop, you don't stop. Rock it to the bang, bang, boogie. I says, what is this? I says, okay, I tell you what. I marry the three of you together. You meet me tomorrow at the studio. And that's how the Sugar Hill Gang started.